Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Bisan Kassab. Allow me to welcome you all in the Arab Hub for Social Protection from COVID. We cover many different partners with us. many partners from Lebanon and from Egypt. And today's topic is access to vaccine in the Arab region. What do we know? This is the second webinar that we organized following the first webinar under the title of social justice in the Arab world. Today we will be discussing vaccines from a relevant perspective by focusing on transitional justice and the ability of everyone to access the vaccines regardless of their situation and social class as part of the social protection policies in our countries. Our countries are considered as the third world countries. And this is why it is important for us to highlight these questions in comparison with other developed countries. Usually the priority for the right to life is given to those who own technology and money, and this is why today's dis discussion is essential. Even though we need to achieve a certain level of immunity at the level of a community, as mentioned by WHO, this is why we are all interested now in discussing this topic and having an in-depth dialogue. We will be focusing on the uh, TRIPS agreement, the intellectual property agreement. So this is why we need to see whether this agreement will be respected or not in order to ensure the access of everyone to the vaccines. So this is one of our priorities for the purpose of discussions, and we hope that we can listen to multiple opinions and perspectives. Let me remind you before we start that you can also access interpretation in case you need it. You can also send questions to the speakers through social media or through the Q&A option via Zoom. We will start first by with Mr. Jupa Kamar, a legal advisor of the Third World Network. He will be taking the floor first and he will talk about the international market for vaccines, intellectual properties, as well as the technologies uh, producing the vaccines in light of trips and the possibilities uh, of having um, more uh, uh, pressure on India and on other countries, as well as the possibility of breaking any agreements from the from the west from the west mr jupa kamar will also discuss how the civil society can help us more in this regard especially if uh, third world governments do not adopt this idea so welcome mr jupa kamar we are listening to you the floor is yours thank you thank you Pisa. and uh, thank you all the organizers for uh, for uh, making this uh, webinar uh, happen so we can discuss uh, one of the very relevant issues that the current uh, uh, humanity is facing especially people living in the developing countries are facing now so, uh, last year all of us were um, uh, you know searching in the darkness whether we have what's exact remedy uh, to contain this pandemic or to respond to this pandemic. Uh, as all of us knows that we need a range of medical products, starting from a measurement of temperature to the measurement of oxygen to ventilators, all kind of instruments are required, and which also includes medicines, diagnostic kits, as well as vaccines. So we had nothing specifically to uh, treat um, the COVID, uh, uh, COVID uh, infections. So as of now, we do have vaccines target the uh, uh, COVID. We do have certain medicines, but which give some kind of relief, but they are not really treating 
COVID. The only product which is currently available targeting COVID is vac uh, you know uh, is vaccine. And these vaccines, as all of us know, that it is not a preventive vaccine, but it is supposed to reduce the severity of the disease. Once the severity of disease goes down, people need not get hospitalized, and there won't be a run for hospital. And people can uh, have a mild infection, if at all it happens, and then uh, you know recover soon. So this is the idea behind this. Uh, 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 you know the, the first generation vaccines as of today but at the same time uh, the uh, public health tells you that you need to have a success in vaccine is that at least you need to um, cover substantial percent of the population at least 70 percent of the population need to be vaccinated globally then only you can uh, have the desired result or you can you may expect that okay there is some way you can break the chain of uh, 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 this uh, pandemic but as all of us know that the majority of the people who are living in the global south do not have access to the uh, vaccine as of now uh, as of 30th of march around uh, 55 uh, 555 million doses were uh, used for vaccination so out of this if you take the top 10 countries you will find except china and india all are all very uh, uh, you know, developed countries, uh, mainly in the uh, Europe and US, including Turkey. Uh, only except is China and uh, uh, China and uh, uh, China and uh, India. Uh, but then comes the Indonesia. So these are the three developing countries. Then you find Morocco and uh, UAE. These are the only two Arab countries which have covered, you know, vaccinated more than uh, a million people. So Morocco is around 7 million people, uh, UAE is around 8, uh, 8 uh, point something uh, million of people. So this shows that the, where the people is there, where the vaccination is required, where vaccines are not there yet. So you are in a situation where you have vaccine, but that is not reachable to majority of the people. What exactly happened? So we, we do have around 14, um, vaccines uh, have been approved for uh, COVID. So some of these vaccines from the same uh, vaccine manufacturers, but produced by different uh, locations or different uh, manufacturers through licensing. Therefore, we do have, in a way, there are 14 vaccines. For instance, vaccine produced uh, in India by Serum Institute is actually an AstraZeneca vaccine uh, from the Oxford University, but it is treated as two separate vaccines. So. Let us not uh, get into the very details of these numbers, but roughly we have 14 vaccines, but that's not enough to vaccinate the substantial population uh, of, of the global uh, or substantial global population. So what we require is the uh, a scale up our production. To scale up the production, to make it available at an affordable price so that we can vaccinate the people at the earliest. So, what the data tells you? Let me just uh, uh, share my screen if possible. I do have a presentation. Okay. Uh, uh, Sayyid Juba Kumar, but I want to ask you to add Mr. Juba Kumar, I kindly ask you to adjust your microphone because we can hear yeah. a lot yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah, problems. Yeah. So, yes, thank so, you. That's much better. We could not hear you before. Yeah, well. yeah, so yeah. that's better. Uh, so should I repeat what I said? OK, <laughs> I, I think precisely what I'm uh, alluring to is that uh, there is a huge demand of vaccine, but vaccines are not there. So there is a need to scale up the production for vaccine. Right. And the developing country people are not able to access the vaccine, um, especially in the Arab region. Only two countries who have crossed a uh, million doses of vaccination, UAE around eight million and Morocco around seven million. Rest of the Arab countries are far below um, of the vaccination when Saudi Arabia is having around four point uh, uh, something uh, million doses. So having said this, we really need to scale up the production how do we scale up the production can i uh, share my screen yeah thank you uh, so when you talk about uh, scaling up of the production and the always the vaccine companies try to uh, prevent the competitions therefore they can make maximum money uh, in the normal course but we are in a pandemic situation okay so 
uh, we do know that everybody is working not only for charity, but they do have uh, to make profit, but a reasonable profit. But as of now, uh, these com many of these companies are not ready to share the technologies with the companies. So there are a lot of unutilized capacity existing around the globe. But if those companies get the technology, they are in a position to make use of this technology and scale up the production and make the vaccines available at an affordable cost. But not all the companies are ready for that. So as a result, there is a concentration of production and uh, these companies are not in a position to supply and to meet the demand. So we are in, a, in, a, in an artificial vaccine famine as of now. So the intellectual property regime heavily contribute uh, to the control of the originator companies or the companies who develop these vaccines. Okay. And, all, uh, and also the regulatory regime. I will explain in my subsequent uh, slides how this control is exercised. So let us start with the global IP regime. Global IP regime consisting of, you can say, the TRIPS agreement and a lot of free trade agreements containing the intellectual property protection. What does the uh, global IP uh, regime, the TRIPS agreement does? TRIPS agreement obligates all the WTO member states to provide a minimum standard of protection and enf enforcement of all the intellectual property rights around eight types of intellectual property rights, patents, copyright, trademark, industrial design, uh, uh, the farmers uh, uh, protection, uh, IC chip protection. So there are, a, a, it, it's a comprehensive agreement which obligates countries to provide a minimum standard of protection and enforcement of various intellectual property rights. Medical products, including medicines are protected through multiple intellectual property rights. So there are, uh, uh, you know, your diagnostic missions are protected through the uh, co copyright protection because of the software contains in that. The medicines are protected uh, through patents by and large, also trademark because many medicines have a brand name, medicines have brand name, and it is also protected through copyright because of the many packets inserts uh, are protected through the copyright. So there are multiple protection around any medical products. But uh, we are aware of certain types of intellectual property protections are very crucial. It's just implications on access to medicines or access to medical products. For example, patent has a direct impact on access to medicine. How does patent impact? Patent gives a monopoly to the patent holder. Nobody can produce that patented product or patented molecule without the permission of the patent holder. As a result, a pharmaceutical company which owns a patent that is always owned by, by and large, owned by the transnational corporations from the Western countries. So these companies have complete control during the duration of the uh, patent protection to prevent any other generic companies to produce the same product. So for instance, a company like Gilead, when they invented uh, and, uh, and introduced the product called Sofosobavir, if there was a patent in Egypt, if there were a patent in Egypt, Farco companies, the Farco Pharma could not have produced the generic version of that product. Uh, luckily for Egypt and people of Egypt, there was no patent. As a result, Farco could produce that medicine at a very cheaper price. And in a way, Egypt, which had a highest burden of hepatitis C, is now almost eradicated the infection. So this is what is happening. But the Western countries who are having, countries like Spain, et cetera, who are having the uh, hepatitis C patients, they are not able to get the, uh, this patented medicine. Why? Because the price is so high, around $84,000 uh, you know, $84, is the imprinted MR. That means maximum retail price for a patient for a 12 weeks treatment. So this cannot be afforded. So there, every hepatitis C patient may not get the uh, Sofosobavir. This medicine is can cure 90 uh, to 95% of the uh, uh, patients. So this is the way the patent works. Okay. So therefore, um, the under the TRIPS agreement, understanding these implications of patent on access to medicine, uh, the founders of the agreement says that there are certain flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement that you can use, like compulsory license. That is that even though there is a patent, 
the patent office or the government can issue a license to a generic manufacturer to produce a patented medicine to ensure that nobody is denied treatment. But this is, uh, you know, easier than, uh, you know, easier to tell than, than really done because many times when the developing countries try to use the compulsory license, they will come under tremendous political pressure from developed countries. Also many times from the international media. So countries are really afraid, developing countries are really afraid to use that, but whenever they used, the patient benefited out of it. So having said this, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies and the developed countries are aware that there are flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement. So therefore, uh, the monopoly it can be broken using the flexibilities. So therefore, what did they do? They came up with the free trade agreements. They included, normally the free trade agreements till then, till 90s were dealing with only the trade in goods. Now you have a comprehensive free trade agreement, which includes obligations to protect intellectual property rights. So these intellectual property rights obligations created under the free trade agreements goes beyond what is there in the TRIPS agreement. It's in a way reduces your flexibility. So for instance, the patent, uh, the TRIPS agreement says that the duration of the patent is 20 years. But under the FTA agreement, you have to extend the patent beyond 20 years. It can go up to 25 years or even more than certain under certain agreements, okay? Or even uh, in a, um, uh, under the TRIPS agreement, there is no obligation on the regulatory authorities not to uh, grant a, uh, not to grant a uh, regulatory approval or a marketing approval for a patented medicine uh, for a generic company. That means the, a generic company like Farco can obtain a marketing approval for a patented medicine, but they cannot market it. The moment they market it, it might be an infringement of the patent, but that will be dealt by the court. Okay, but the re drug regulatory authority say the Egyptian uh, drug regulatory authority would say, we don't have a problem of giving you marketing approval. We look at only the quality and whether you are following the standard procedure. If you satisfy, we will give you. It's a certification for the quality, but producing, marketing, and incurring legal liability for patent infringement, that is your case and you, you do it in the court. But the free trade agreements, what they do, they are linking, they are preventing the regulatory agencies from granting such marketing approval. So these are some of the examples of uh, TRIPS Plus. So we live in a world where many developing countries are party to various uh, free trade agreements. As a result, they, are they, they do not have the enough flexibility, like a country who signed, who, who, who is not part of the WTO or the country who signed only TRIPS agreement, okay? If a country who is not part of the WTO, there is no obligation to provide even a patent protection for medicines. That was the world we lived uh, in, uh, you know, uh, before 1995. Then we live in a world now, many countries are party to the TRIPS agreement, but many countries are not party to the, uh, they are party to the, not only TRIPS agreement, but also to the free trade agreement. So their flexibility, those countries, the third category of countries have a very, very limited flexibilities. That takes me to the vaccine issue, okay? As I told you already that there are 559 million doses were used, but majority of these uh, doses are in uh, concentrated in 10 countries. So we know that, so vast majority uh -huh. of may i interrupt you mr mr yeah. Kamal? you still have five minutes only yeah yeah I'm, I'm i'm just going to conclude yeah don't worry yeah uh so uh so we need uh, there is a huge unmet demand okay so uh the how the intellectual property affects the vaccine intellectual property affects the vaccine in two ways one is patent protection and another one is trade secret protection this prevents a company to copy the technology or emulate the technology and produce an existing vaccine. Patent, of course, you can bypass that barrier by obtaining a compulsory license, okay? So there are multiple patents on, on uh, in a different aspects of the vaccine, okay? This slide, you can see that there is a patent on a vaccine dosage, patent on a vaccine delivery, and so one single vaccine could be covered with multiple patents. But end of the day, at least theoretically speaking, you can obtain a compulsory license, but that's not enough. There comes the trade secret. How the trade secret operates, and I explained to you that, and then I, I, I conclude my presentation. So what happens in the case of trade secret? 
say if you produce a paracetamol and i copy that paracetamol even though it's a patented paracetamol uh, i copied using my own technological knowledge nobody is going to ask me that the regulatory agency is not going to ask me that uh, whether you followed the originator's manufacturing process or they will not look into what manufacturing process i followed they look at end of the day what i produced is a paracetamol but when you do the same thing with the vaccine they will ask you it's not enough you are you have produced this vaccine but you have to prove this vaccine is safe and efficacious so how do you prove that it is safe and efficacious that is through the clinical trial so that means a company who has the technological capability cannot copy that technology and in an unless they do not have the resources to they do uh, uh, they do have the resources to carry out the clinical trial because as a result of this regulatory requirement many companies in the developing world cannot copy the technology and produce the vaccine only a limited companies can do that so this is the way the regulatory agencies agencies are uh, protecting the trade secret how do they protect because they would say that if you do not get the technology from the originator then you have to carry out all these tests right and this forces the companies to obtain the technologies from the originator otherwise you have to carry out all these tests and it is time consuming it is resource consuming and resource intensive so as a result in a indirectly you are giving you are protecting the trade secret of the agency so la- let me uh, take uh, now i have 2 minutes right i'll just go to my last slide so what we re- really required under this situation is that two solutions one is we need to waive the trips obligations under the trips agreement for vaccines so therefore the dossiers filed by the uh, vaccine companies can be made public and that can be used by a another company to produce the vaccine right then you don't have to follow all these clinical studies and second what we say that something called an accelerated pathway by world health organization so instead of forcing every company to reinvent the wheel every company to follow the clinical trials every company to carry out the safety trials you can develop certain uh, markers you can develop certain criteria if you satisfy that you can allow that company to introduce that product without a clinical trial then the vaccine more and more companies can enter into the vaccine market and it can bring down the price drastically and the last option is that uh, you know the, there should be a technology should be widely available but the originators are not ready to give that therefore this is the two important measures that a civil society should push for it then that will bring down the bargaining power of the originator vaccine companies and there would be much more equitable access thank you i think i take 2 3 minutes extra sorry for that Thank you very much, Mr. Jupa Kumar. We shall move now to Dr. Ala Awad. He is in charge of the right to health in the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights. He will be talking about the policies for accessing vaccine in Egypt as well as their relationships and interlinks. And I know that uh, Dr. Ala also has his own stance. He also supports the importance of providing vaccines for free to everyone in Egypt. Welcome, Doctor. The floor is yours. Dr. Ala, can you hear us? It's, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Good evening. My name is Dr. Ala Ghannam. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being present with us today. Allow me first and foremost to present the vision of the Egyptian initiative and my own perspective about these different questions. And let me start with your third point pertaining to the international vaccine market during the 
pandemic. And then I will go back to the first question and the policies for accessing vaccines in the Arab world and their distribution. And I will end with the study of uh, Egypt, the case study of Egypt from a comprehensive perspective, including politics and the economy. And we will see the impact of that analysis on our uh, health system, which was established in the 19th century. And I will focus more on the vaccine policies in particular. Ever since the first months of the pandemic, there were many concerns that uh, uh, there will be no fair distribution of vaccines around the world. This is why WHO at an early stage uh, in uh, April 2020 launched the initiative to ensure um, the um, four components of uh, uh, the uh, measures taken such as diagnosis treatment and focusing on the uh, COVAX uh, vaccines. The fourth point is also linked to the comprehensive medical systems. Let me start with the COVAX initiative. COVAX is supervised by uh, three entities, Gavi, WHO, and another partner. This is a funding mechanism in order to buy the vaccines for countries through which the countries will be buying and through which they will guarantee providing those vaccines to low and middle income countries. Can you still hear me? Hello? Sama? Can you still hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, COVAX is an initiative for buying and distributing uh, vaccines to countries in dire need. And by 2021, COVAX wants to ensure 2 million doses of vaccines, which will cover around 20% of the needs of all of the poor and middle income countries. Gavi is the main player in COVAX. And Gavi is an institution established in 2000 to bridge the gap of funding around the world. It is an international alliance between private and public institutions to protect the health of countries such including UNICEF, the World Bank, the private sector and many other stakeholders. Let me talk now about the impact of this unfair distribution on developing countries, especially Egypt. The wealthy countries uh, had bilateral agreements directly contracted with the companies without going through COVAX, especially that COVAX is optional and not compulsory. This allowed the rich to buy soon, and this made the uh, low and middle income countries access the vaccine a bit late. Uh, this is in addition to the funding gap that that COVAX faces. So the situation with, with COVAX is better than nothing. However, eventually there are still major concerns that COVAX cannot uh, on its own ensure its promises. Now the international trend of South Africa and India is that they wanted to, to suspend the uh, trips uh, temporarily which might contribute to a larger extent in ensuring a larger production of vaccines. And this will also provide an opportunity around the world to ensure a faster production internationally. And this will be a real start for the social solidarity and international solidarity in countering this pandemic. It is known that these types of pandemics are transboundary, they can touch multiple social classes without any well-known structure. So this is why the idea of international solidarity is essential. Otherwise, the world will be facing a problem. I think that Egypt and the African Union also supported the, um, uh, the suspension of uh, the TRIPS uh, agreement, whereas other countries around the world has, have a few used such as the European Union and the USA. And this file is still under discussion and there has been no final decision made yet. This is the first uh, point pertaining to the fair distribution of vaccines in light of the pandemic. The second point pertaining to the vaccination policies in the Arab world or especially in the Arab uh, region. 
to be honest, we cannot uh, think about all of the Arab countries in one basket. To simplify, we usually say that we have three categories of economic countries, uh, oil producing and rich countries, some of them are well known and have already achieved a lot of progress, such as the UAE, where around 8 million have been vaccinated, in addition to other countries, similarly to Egypt, which has achieved a middle level of vaccination, whereas the poor and conflict-torn countries such as Yemen and Libya are facing major difficulties. So these are the three categories uh, to divide uh, uh, Arab countries. And this is why we need to think about their agreement, uh, about their social and economic background. I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you, but can you turn on your camera? I'm trying to open it, but I'm not sure how. You need to press on start video. Can you see me now? Yes, we can. So let me repeat my last point. The Arab countries cannot be all placed in one basket. We have uh, rich countries, middle income countries, and poor uh, countries, as well as politically unstable countries. Some of the rich uh, and oil producing Arab countries do not even need COVAX and they conducted uh, direct uh, uh, purchases from the companies based on supply and demand. And they have already paid a lot of sums. We apologize. It seems that Dr. Ala has faced a technical glitch. We can no longer hear him. I am back, says Dr. Ala. I also wish to say that some of the Arab countries might be fully or partially relying on COVAX. The wealthy and rich countries have uh, bought the uh, vaccine directly, whereas in Morocco, for instance, 14 million people have already received the vaccination and they had conducted also uh, agreements with the Chinese companies early on. With regards to the vaccination policy in Egypt, it is obvious that it would rely mostly on COVAX. This is with regards to the vaccination uh, policies in the Arab world. So I repeat that we cannot truly place them all in one basket. Let me discuss more the, the case study of Egypt. Can you still hear me, says the speaker? Yes. So Egypt is a middle income country, according to the ranking of the World Bank. The GDP is around $330 billion, and we have many economic and political challenges, as well as a major gap in social protection and social justice between urban rural areas, between the north and the south, between the richest and the poorest. Moreover, in Egypt, there is a high percentage of workers in the informal sector, which should also be taken into consideration, and their percentage in the GDP might account to 40 to 50 percent, which is an important point to be taken in the policy adopted by the Egyptian government. Overall, the performance of the medical system throughout the pandemic, according to the different quality indicators, non-discrimination and indicators, and based on Article 18 of the Egyptian Constitution, which considers health as a right, and in light of the presence of a comprehensive medical coverage, which has been implemented recently, 
And then the framework of a two year campaign that was launched to uh, counter virus C recently, which has also achieved uh, some of the results. And in the framework of another campaign to uh, counter NACDs, the overall performance of the Egyptian government ever since the start of the pandemic last year was characterized uh, by an attempt to, to try and ensure a balance between the economy and health. And this is why they did not uh, use the full lockdown. They only used partial lockdown for limited periods of time. And that performance was a reactive performance. It was too slow and it was not a proactive uh, uh, approach. This is quite clear with the lack of any detailed information pertaining to the number of infections and their distribution and the lack of information about uh, a major uh, PCR, so lack of uh, accurate uh, statistics about uh, PCR. This was obvious following the first wave ever since the mid-August 2020 about the possibility of providing the vaccines to the largest numbers of uh, citizens, especially in light of uh, no lockdown policy to uh, protect the economy. Ever since the beginning, the Egyptian government relied on contacting the Gavi board and the COVAX initiative, which was dedicated for middle income and low income countries. They focus mainly on the COVAX initiative. In parallel, the Egyptian government was also trying to have direct uh, contracts with the produ vaccine producing companies as declared officially, with which the relationship will be subjected to the supply and demand and the free and open market. And this will also uh, be related to the capacity of the companies in producing major vaccines. They have also received uh, some smaller grants from uh, neighboring countries or brotherly countries such as the UAE and China. Despite uh, Egypt took part in the early clinical studies with 3,000 Egyptian volunteers who were ready to actually be a part of the last phases of the clinical studies, for the Chinese uh, uh, vaccine. But we have seen contradicting statements from the officials about the availability of vaccines and the contracted numbers. And this led to the lack of trust and people did not, uh, did not choose to take the vaccine. And this is why they said that the vaccines will be provided uh, based on priorities. And I think that uh, the priority system is an international priority. We should start with the medics, uh, medical staff, volunteers, paramedics, and then the elderly and people with chronic diseases. These are the international and well-known uh, priorities. And there was also an idea suggested about uh, imposing a small fee on the wealthy citizens. However, the government still cannot do that because of the pressure of the civil society, especially that vaccines have been provided for free for the uh, medical staff until today. So this had an impact on the performance of the medical system overall in Egypt. And this has shown the complexities of our medical system, and it has shown how the private sector plays an important role in it. And it, ha it has also shown the, um, uh, the uh, limited budget allocated to it. Now, three or four months following the second wave of the pandemic, the Egyptian government provided uh, bigger numbers of the Chinese and Indian vaccines, around 750,000 doses. According to the statement of the government and their recent statement on the 28th of March, as the 750,000 doses are mostly gifts uh, given by China and the UAE until today. Those who have registered to receive the vaccine are half a million citizens who truly wish to get the vaccine on the electronic system, which we also have some question marks about in addition to the medical teams working on the front lines. Uh, 
so these are the people who have already received the vac vaccine, the frontliners, as well as only 50,000 citizens, mostly from the elderly and from the medical staff. These are the only people who have received the vaccine so, so far. According to the recent uh, statistics of the government, we are still waiting for larger quantities and larger numbers of doses based on uh, the agreement through COVAX done following an agreement between the Egyptian government and COVAX. And this will account to approximately 20% of the quantity we need for the uh, citizens in Egypt, which accounts to around 40 million doses. But we are still waiting for them. And this is the end of March. And the recent governmental statement mentioned that the end of March, which is already the end of March, we will be receiving 8.6 million doses from the AstraZeneca vaccine, in addition to 20 million additional doses that will also be received from Russia. The total estimated number of doses that has been declared by the Egyptian government, according to their recent statement, is around 100 million doses as they have officially declared and they have agreed uh, agreed on bringing 40 million AstraZeneca vaccines based on the COVAX and Gavi initiative, as well as 8 million doses already received as uh, grants. I apologize for interrupting you, Dr. Ala. That's it for my side, says Dr. Ala. That's it from my side. Thank you very much, Dr. Ala. I kindly encourage you to raise any questions you have in the questions and answers option. And I'd rather keep all the questions until the end. Let's move to the next speaker, Dr. Fuad Fuad from Lebanon, from the American University of Beirut. Dr. Fuad, good evening and welcome. Can you hear me well, says Dr. Fuad? Yes, we can. Thank you for being present with us today. I would like to listen to you, Dr. Fuad. Can you tell us more about the situation in Lebanon? Can you describe the fair distribution and fair access to vaccines? Uh, we're talking about social justice, and we would also like to listen to the capacities of Lebanon, especially in light of the current crisis in Lebanon. So can you describe in principle uh, the system used right now? Thank you very much. First and foremost, thank you for this presentation, and thank you for the Arab Reform Initiative as well for bringing us together and for inviting us to attend this webinar. I will choose to speak in English because my slides are in English and I apologize. So I think uh, I cannot agree more with Dr. Kuba Kumar and uh, Dr. Ala on uh, how they approach the issue of uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccination and the way that um, the issue of uh, the distribution of, of, of uh, the vaccine. But my argument will start maybe from different uh, perspective or at least slightly different perspective. I will use the political economy analysis tool to approach this issue and specifically, which is of course can be applied on, on many countries on different, on different disciplines, including health, but also on a different health topics, including COVID-19 and the vaccination itself. So uh, using this tool, I will try to apply that on the situation in Lebanon, but also we'll see how we can see that also in Syria, inside Syria. Um, Syria as, as a, now as a sort of black hole in terms of you know, information, uh, you know, situation, including healthcare. So my argument also start from the issue that COVID-19 is um, uh, as, as a health uh, topic is not isolated or you know, from 
health uh, health care system at large and health by itself or health care uh, system by itself is not actually separated disconnected from the political and economic uh, 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 determinants. Uh, let me uh, share uh, a few slides here just to, uh, to try to be brief and uh, can you see the, um, uh, the slides? Okay, so uh, uh, the definition, my definition to, to health here is about how the allocations of political resources and economic resources affect who gets what, when, and how in relation to health. And this is ad adopted from uh, Rick on, on his definition about the political economy of health. I'm trying to, to see that in light of COVID-19. In, in, in Lebanon, just to remind you with some figures, up till now, till March 27, the number of cumulative cases is almost half million in a country that even with refugees is not more than 6 million. So we're talking about those positive tested uh, cases, almost like a half million. That means we're talking about mainly roughly uh, like 20 to 30% of population got affected with, with, um, with COVID-19 in the last uh, year. Uh, uh, the number of deaths, uh, uh, also the cumulative number is uh, around 6,000 uh, in the past 24 hours, still the, uh, the, the, the figures are high. We're, we're talking about uh, average between, you know, uh, 200, 2,500 till four to 5,000 new cases daily. As for vaccine, uh, Lebanon is still low actually in, in uh, um, uh, covering uh, the uh, vaccine to the population. So I put here uh, uh, till also March 27 that Lebanon was able to cover 2.5% of population with, the, with at least uh, one dose of vaccine comparing with Jordan. 3% not to compare with UK that showed, you know, high percentage, like 50% of population got vaccinated of that. So Lebanon is uh, really still very low in that. And in this process, when talking about, you know, that, you know, almost like a 2.5% uh, got vaccinated, that means uh, Lebanon will not reach uh, the, um, uh, the target of 20% uh, of population by the end of this year in, in this sort of steps. Uh, uh, what we have is a sort of uh, a crude number about the vaccination. There's no segregation data on Syrian and, and Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, uh, even more, nor on migrant workers. And just to remind the audience that Syrians in Lebanon, in Lebanon is almost around uh, um, uh, 1 million. Uh, Palestinians, the number is also uh, between 200,000 and 400. It depends on uh, how we see that number. But according to uh, uh, honor rights, almost like a 400,000 registered Palestinian in Lebanon. And the same number of migrant workers, people that came from Asia, from Africa to work in Lebanon. We don't have data about how many vaccinated uh, in, uh, uh, you know, um, among those uh, two groups of three groups of population. So if we took, uh, if we take this uh, number uh, uh, in the last month between February 14 till March 27, we know now the total number of vaccination or, or doses is uh, around 190,000 doses between the do, uh, uh, first dose and second dose. At the same time of, of a period of time, uh, uh, a newly uh, 100,000 positive cases were registered. So if this is the situation, so you can imagine that, this, you know, we will, uh, you know, in Lebanon, the health care system will not be able to reach population. And that's why uh, the process is very slow. When thinking about the, uh, the electronic platform that people registered, 
we know now that only 20% registered, almost 1 million. And among them, 1.4 are Palestinian refugees and 1.3 are Syrian refugees. And to be honest, I think there's no clear definition in the platform about, you know, Palestinian, if, the, if they are refugees or not, but that's, that's, this is an assumption that those who are registered, you know, uh, have this uh, uh, legal title or legal, legal label. So uh, for Palestinian and Syrians, even for uh, uh, register, you know, in registering at the platform, the number uh, 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 is very low. So what, what is behind that? As you, many of the audience know, the, the health system in Lebanon is uh, fragmented and this is not a new. You know, there's a national health system that's a, a, a mainly private actually health system. 80% of hospital beds are private, 50% of population are uninsured, but also there's a parallel system for Palestinian refugees, you know, uh, uh, you know run by, uh, uh, UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. And the third one, which is, you know, um, the, uh, the healthcare system run by uh, UNHCR uh, for Syrian refugees. Although they, they work collaboratively with, with the, uh, the uh, Lebanese uh, government, but still they have, you know, their own structure to provide health for, for Syrian refugees. In addition to these three health systems, there's a fourth one, which is an informal health system run by you know, Syrian and Palestinian health workers who are not allowed to practice uh, you know, in Lebanon according or due to the lack of a work permit uh, or, or, or securing a work permit by uh, these two group of population. In addition to the fragmentation of the health system, there's also on an on a, on a <clears throat> economic level an extreme inequality in both income and wealth. So the richest 1% of population uh, uh, receive 25% of the national income, whereas the 50 other 50% of the poorest uh, uh, receive less than uh, uh, 10%. So there's also a, a, a sort of imbalance in, in power in the health sector, health sector and the clientelism in, in, in public sector where you know the sectarian based political economy that undermines the capacity and uh, capability of uh, 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 public services. This slide show that the top, as I mentioned, the top 10% actually receive uh, more than almost like a 50 percent, whereas the 50 percent of the poorest, you know, less than you know 15 percent of the national income. I will skip these two slides, and just to show here some uh, uh, political indicators. So, in addition to the you know uh, some demographic and and health indicators and other economic indicators, what's missing usually in the narrative about uh, health is the what we called it you know the political indicators and i choose here from the uh from the uh, world bank indicators on that three indicators uh, are really the governance one is about the government effectiveness second is the control of corruption and third is about the voice and accountability and i actually i selected also few countries but just to to check the numbers of Lebanon, maybe Jordan, and to compare it with, you know, Syria here and here is South Korea. So uh, the uh, it's a percentage. So the number is out of hundred. So you you can see that the the government effectiveness in Lebanon is almost like eighteen percent, comparing with eighty eight for South Korea and fifty six in Jordan, whereas in Syria is only 3.4% 4, 3 on that. Uh, the, uh, the, the other indicator is the corruption in Lebanon is 12% comparing with, you know, 60%, you know, 12 is bad, you know, comparing with the 60%, you know, of, you know, about controlling in, in Jordan and 76 in, in 
South Korea, whereas in Syria is 1.4. And the same with accountability. You know, the issue of uh, the voice and accountability in Lebanon is 32. In Jordan is bad, it's 29, same like in Lebanon, whereas Korea, South Korea is 72, and now Syria is 1.4. What does it mean? What all these numbers mean? That tell us actually that cannot, you know, when thinking about uh, health indicators, including infant mortality, you know, with the issue of uh, maternal uh, mortality and even COVID and COVID vaccination, we cannot, dis you know, uh, 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 dismantle, disconnect that from the, uh, the uh, um, political indicators, but mainly for, for, for me, I would argue that the uh, uh, political uh, indicators are really very important. As for Syria, I'll be try to be very quick. It's as, as I mentioned before, it's a really a black hole. So uh, according to WHO, the true scope uh, of uh, the breakdown uh, outbreak is unknown. Well, that's due to many issues, you know. Of course, we're talking about limited test capacity, underreporting, which is another word of lack of transparency and the lack of access to healthcare. And again, I, I bring to this uh, a term about weaponization of health care in Syria as a sort of a, a, a concept to, to explain uh, uh, why, you know, still COVID, like any other healthcare, is still a, a big gap in, in, in providing health to uh, Syria themselves after 10 years of devastating war. According to WHO and Ministry of Health, Syrian Ministry of Health, we can see the numbers in a uh, government controlled area here is 18, only 18,000 since a year and, and uh, 1,200 deaths, which is comparing with a small country, smaller country like in Lebanon, we're talking about you know, a half million uh, uh, you know, positive cases. Uh, uh, even in, in, in Northwest Syria that, uh, you know, uh, now controlled by, uh, you know, some Islamist group and, and uh, 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 supported by the uh, uh, Turkish uh, troops that we have 21,000 uh, and uh, in uh, Northeast Syria, uh, 9,000. So um, this is to, uh, to, to, to say that still there's a huge gap in, in, uh, in information. And that's the same with the vaccination. You know, uh, last February, uh, uh, the Syrian Minister of, of Health uh, said that they had received vaccination from a friendly country without mentioning who's this country and how many and how this will be distributed, you know, in the country. Uh, on the other side, China said that they will send 150 doses of vaccine to Syria, but yet uh, it, uh, uh, you know, it had not been uh, delivered. Uh, WHO talking about you know, uh, providing uh, uh, vaccination through the COVAX that mentioned by Dr. Ala to include like a 20% of population by end of 2021. All these sort of media to say news, I mean, uh, in, in, in the light of also Lack of transparency, you know, uh, it, 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 it stay like a, just a media news and nothing uh, yet uh, has been uh, uh, applied in Syria and, and as in many actually uh, reports now, uh, most of hospitals are overwhelmed with cases uh, and, and uh, you know, turn that to be again, Syria is a, a country that are, uh, being un unfortunately uh, now uh, not just out of, out of geography, but out uh, Dr. Fuad, as for the answer to your question, we are already at the I stopped here. I mean, just I show this picture uh, about you know from uh, the Syrian media showing it's just an example um, uh, about the issue of uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, social distances and the lack of any protection uh, means even, you know, at the level of uh, high, the higher power uh, in Syria.
Thank you very much for listening. Shukra. Good afternoon again. We will move now to the last speaker before opening the floor for questions and answers, Dr. Al Asad Msahli from Tunisia. He is an expert in health policies. Welcome, Dr. Al Asad. Tunisia is on the borders with Morocco, or actually close to Morocco. So my question is, we have not heard from Tunisia the same advancement in providing vaccines at a largely scale, which was the case in Morocco. We do not, we, so can you explain more what happened in Tunisia? And can you explain whether the system ensures social justice in principle and in terms of implementation? Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I kindly ask you to start your video because we cannot see you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I would like to thank you for choosing this topic, which comes at the right, at the right time. This is actually one of the main priorities of the Arab world, and it is also an international priority. I will choose to speak in French. However, my keynotes are written in English, so I apologize if you will have to uh, watch a language and listen to a different language. The title that I have chosen is Abuse of Rights. En période de vaccination anti-COVID. Abuse of rights and abuse of weaknesses and anti-COVID-19 vaccines. It's a, a public politics issue because the COVID-19 problem started in uh, 2002 and uh, it was MERS uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia and the following years. So with regard to the different uh, uh, countries, uh, only six uh, countries the Asia South uh, countries were able to adapt their economies and come up with a way to address such situations. Why am I speaking about that? Because we are already in a, a, a vacuum of information. We face a, an issue of identities. Uh, the COVID-19 is a complex, uh, life-threatening uh, disease difficult uh, to diagnose in terms of typologies and at the same time it constitutes an environment that is uh, based on uh, corruption bad political decision making processes that affect the population that is why i have four main and key points uh, real quick, first, the COVID-19 situation in Tunisia, the abuse of rights and anti-COVID-19 vaccines, the uh, abuse of uh, weaknesses and anti-COVID-19 vaccines. It is uh, very important, the responsibilities of the uh, countries, the abuse of weaknesses and vulnerabilities uh, as to the uh, duty to protect the population. To conclude, I will uh, discuss the strategic orientations. First point regarding the COVID-19 situation in Tunisia. First, the COVID-19 handling uh, in Tunisia is totally uh, by the uh, state, uh, so all uh, people on the territories, and here we have Article uh, uh, 
8 uh, of the uh, law 9271 and uh, we have also certain uh, articles that guarantee the non-discrimination whatever is the um, country of origin several studies have been published uh, and i'm proud to have taken part in such uh, studies and here you see the organization of the pharmaceutical uh, system in general you have the monopoly of the state i.e importation can only happen through the central pharmacy of tunisia by law and this entity had started to uh, uh, enter in the force uh, in 1961 it started uh, to uh, enter into force through the decree law of january 16 of 1960 so the central pharmacy of Tunisia monopolizes the importation of all vaccines and medications in Tunisia, but from an economic perspective, it is not a monopoly uh, process. What is the monopoly? I uh, mean that there is a certain public uh, uh, entity, let's say the central pharmacy that guarantees the mediation between different suppliers at the same time would deliver medication to different uh, clients while allowing uh, uh, competition between suppliers and clients that's with regard to the technical aspect another aspect with regard to the uh, medication in Tunisia, the prices are administered by the state. So we have uh, harmonized prices all over the Tunisian territories. The prices are not f uh, free. They're administered by the state. And whenever uh, changes are introduced, uh, uh, a circular is issued by the public administration with the approval of the Ministry of uh, Health and the Ministry of Trade that uh, determine prices. Now, uh, real quick, let's look into the evolution of the mortality in Tunisia, including uh, during the COVID-19, i.e. starting uh, the um, end of uh, 2019 globally up until uh, February uh, 2021. 2021, you see that there is uh, no uh, big increase of mortality and it got uh, uh, corrected thanks to the uh, lockdown and the curfew that uh, uh, reduced the number of mortality due to uh, occupational incidents and uh, also uh, public traffic accidents. And here we see uh, that starting uh, uh, from October 2020, uh, the uh, daily mortality and in gray, we see that the highest mortality is uh, uh, in the uh, center and the, the peripheries because of the lack of uh, the infrastructure that would allow the uh, handling of uh, COVID-19 patients. Now, moving to the situation in Tunisia, we have a quarter uh, uh, confirmed cases, 9,000 uh, deaths. So it is 3%, uh, 215,000. Uh, cases uh, hospitalized and here uh, the follow-up is well done by Enkifada. It's a, an association that provides a lot of uh, trustworthy and credible information. What I'd like to highlight uh, is mainly that uh, we uh, uh, suffer from a one month delay in terms of delivery. 11 million to cover 50% of the population by December 2021. That is the intent. There is a subscription platform. 760,000 got uh, in, in, uh, in re registered. There are a lot of uh, 
uh, hesitations and reluctancy because of the uh, fragilized confidence uh, due to the uh, mismanagement that is uh, not uh, specific to Tunisia, but it is uh, correct elsewhere. Why do I use the term abuse of rights in uh, vaccines uh, fields? It's because these states have a role to play and we've seen competition between the most rich states and the most advanced states. Uh, this vaccine turned into a strategic weapon to uh, redefine certain uh, influence zones and power uh, areas. Unfortunately, we've witnessed uh, uh, periods of predation and uh, the state uh, banditism. We've noted uh, that uh, by the uh, Czech Republic that used the Italian uh, supplies in the US, for example, the exportation of masks to France was blocked. We've noticed that uh, as well, the uh, sanitizers exports blockage by France and Germany towards Italy. So unfortunately, it was confirmed uh, by the uh, politics of uh, the President Trump with uh, his uh, famous America first. This competition between countries uh, simply uh, destroyed the solidarity spirit that should uh, be witnessed at the level of countries, and uh, that had caused a lot of questions as to the limits of globalization. And here was the idea of uh, the uh, vaccination uh, passport uh, suggestion, the fundamental rights of uh, human beings are threatened and that could uh, really threaten the mobility of persons as opposed to the mobility of uh, capitals and uh, commodities. Another aspect here, we see the role of the international agreements. And I think that the main idea is clear here. We get to a point where we need flexibility, but we find that uh, at the uh, legal and financial levels, at the level of public relations, uh, at the level of state, uh, interstate relations, and in particular at the technological level and scientific level, things are uh, very critical. And I think that some promises were not honored because the uh, deal of the agreement TRIPS agreement of the WHO was with the poor countries between rich and poor countries. The poor countries, Dr. Asad, Dr. Asad, you, Asad you still one have minute one minute only in order to, to allow, allow the time, time for, for questions. questions and answers. Uh, I, I, I second Dr. Bukamar, who says that there are two main problems at the level of the TRIPS agreement, the protection of the uh, patents, the protection of the uh, trade uh, secrets. And I think that the second is even more dangerous. The protection of the uh, trade uh, secrets blocks access to the uh, generic drugs. And that is uh, the wicked aspect of it. Here we need to apply flexibility, yes, but uh, on the ground, can we do it? Uh, I don't think so currently. Why? Because the Pfizer, uh, the famous vaccine, uh, Pfizer BioNTech uh, is not the only enterprise. There was the neighbor of BioNTech shot, which is specialized in the fabrication of the vials. And the containers and the reform got finalized in September. We have wondered that uh, uh, 
manufacturers, the freezers, and the masters that uh, manufactures the uh, carbon item, and you have societies that have increased their conditioning areas, the conservation uh, areas, and certain conditions. So with the flexibilities for a local production, we need what is the essential, the essential vials. Uh, we would need the uh, refrigeration containers because all of the production at the international level was reserved in order to ensure a certain aspect of strategic uh, and uh, competitive uh, advantages. Another element, it's true that we had an international uh, uh, agreement that guarantees the minimum rules. Dr. Asad. I apologize, Dr. Lasad, because we need to allow time for the questions and answers. I apologize, and I think that some of the questions will be actually related to your topics. There is a question to Dr. Fuad about the role of the private sector in providing the vaccines in light that the fact that some of the companies are trying to import the vaccines to provide it directly for their employees. In an internal or in a smaller system that would cover their own employees. And we need to see, uh, for instance, what will happen in a small country such as Lebanon. We need to see if the state is truly capable of supporting the situation and if it can truly play its role in providing the vaccine. This is the question uh, for Dr. Fuad. Thank you for this question. It is of... Uh, utmost importance, especially when it comes to the privatization of vaccination. And this is usually a bad thing or non acceptable thing, or it leads to a true problem because there will be no real quality control for the vaccines, especially now that we have different conservation methods and different types of vaccines. But we need to not exclude this possibility in a country such as Lebanon, in a country that is fully uh, fragmented with a vulnerable economy. And at the same time, this state has always been used to relying on the private sector and the medical and health sector, especially over the past decade. The private sector provided the um, highest percentage of medical services over the past decade. So we should not neglect this, but I think that personally speaking, in a country such as Lebanon, there is this possibility to provide it for the private sector, provided that there are constraints and conditions, and perhaps this requires uh, some type of supervision from the state, but once again, I remind you of the fragmentation and the gaps, which might lead to another problem. So this is a vicious circle that we all face in the Arab world. And I can briefly say that I think that it should be considered, it is worth considering. The second question for Mr. Jupukamar about the collective uh, bargaining by the low and middle income countries in the Arab world in order to purchase the vaccines, especially that the richest countries of the Arab world have already received the vaccines based on the supply and demand, and they they got a great percentage of those vaccines early on. So do you think that this collective bargaining or negotiating would be one of the solutions? Uh, Mr. Jupa, can you hear this question? Can you hear us? Um, hello, hello, uh, hello. 
you are so to us yeah yeah, yeah. yeah yeah could you could you just once again repeat the question So the question was about collective bargaining or collective negotiations in order to acquire the vaccine in the Arab world. Do you think that this might be a solution for the Arab countries in order to uh, counter the richest uh, countries of this region who have uh, received uh, great uh, numbers of vaccines early on? So do you think that collective bargaining and negotiations is a solution? i think uh, uh, definitely the uh, like the african countries collectively the organization of the african union take initiative to collectively order بس اطلب من حضرتك اطلب من حضرتك تشغيل الفيديو من فضلك i can't ask you to turn on the video and can you please use the microphone closer to you yeah, you yeah. Mean, hello you. Uh, uh, what i am saying is that uh, like the uh, organization of african union um, similarly Uh, the arab uh, uh, or you know arab league of arab state could come together and bargain for a you know order always the bulk orders will bring down the, the drive down the price even you know every country going and purchasing it individually will definitely will have a higher price so the bulk orders will definitely drive down the price at the same time arab countries who are having manufacturing capabilities should promote the manufacturing capabilities and uh, uh, you know ask the producers to Or produce these medicines and uh, vaccines and procure it from there than from an international market like a, 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 at least in egypt two companies have already uh, signed up a licensing agreements and producing this vaccine and similarly other uh, uh, manufacturers in the region can do that because the uh, sputnik vaccine the vaccine from russia that license is much more open it is uh, attached with very less condition so uh, it enable the local production so that's the way i think uh, both of these measures will uh, enhance the ability or the bargaining power of the arab uh, region uh, and to ensure the adequate supply in the coming days Thank you very much for the answer. Do we have any other questions? Or oh, to be honest, I have a question. I have noticed that all of the speakers from the Arab region had something in common. It seems that there is a lack of trust. Uh, and I can take the example from Egypt. We have noticed limited people uh, registering on the platforms. Dr. Ala, what do you think about this? Do you think that people are still reluctant? And I would also like to listen to Dr. Lassad more about Tunisia, about people who are reluctant. Are the Arab governments and Arab states uh, uh, also neglecting uh, The neglecting this and or on purpose doing it so that people will not register? Dr. Ala, you are muted. Dr. Ala, you are muted. I think that these two points that you have just mentioned are right. I think that there is this reluctancy. People are afraid because all of these vaccines have been... Uh, are used only for contingency reasons and they think that the clinical studies aren't full yet and there is lack of trust. It is correct. However, at the same time, the governments did not uh, exert enough efforts to raise awareness about the advantages versus the disadvantages that we might counter if the uh, vaccination is not given to the highest percentage of people. So both answers are correct, in my opinion, and I think that this is related to the nature of the pandemic itself. All of these vaccines have been created uh, in a very short time in comparison with other traditional vaccines that require a lot of time. So both things are credible. However, now with the start of the vaccination campaigns and uh, with people already saying that they already see the side effects and the side effects are at least uh, 
at the direct level or at the short term are not truly serious. Therefore, I believe that if we weigh our uh, cons and pros, definitely this would lead to better campaigns conducted by the state to encourage registration and vaccination. In a country such as Egypt, we need to change the way people perceive the electronic platform. There are already elderly people who have registered, but they are still on the waiting list where other young people uh, got the vaccines earlier on because the new uh, centers have opened and they have registered there. So the government should limit those logistics and people should truly feel that this is a real hope to contain the uh, pandemic. And I think that people will no longer be reluctant when I see it with time. Thank you very much, Dr. Ala, Dr. Lassad. Yes, the situation in Tunisia is very similar with certain differences. When it comes to the disease, we speak about the second and the third wave, but it's not really the case. We speak about a pandemic with variances, and this is very different. Here we have a big question as to the effectiveness of the vaccine. Is it real or not? And that's something we cannot uh, tell so far because there is uh, no uh, sufficient data. We would never be able to tell before August or September, then we'd be able to identify the effectiveness of the vaccines. In addition, with the uh, social uh, media, a big problem emerged. The therapeutic accidents such as uh, the uh, paralysis uh, that was uh, uh, unregistered um, for uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines does exist. It's true that uh, in terms of those who are vaccinated, the number is very low. However, this case is uh, real and it does exist. Let's not forget that we're using such vaccines on uh, sound and healthy people, uh, not sick people. So uh, the, the situation is totally different uh, compared to sick people. Another uh, case, the AstraZeneca vaccine that uh, uh, gives uh, thromboembolic uh, uh, cases and uh, this also uh, constitutes problems and even at the level of the uh, US CDC they've noted that the data wasn't uh, updated and uh, wasn't fully integrated at the level of the risk uh, study. Another element, I'm sorry Dr. Asad. I apologize. I have to end this webinar. I really wanted to listen more, but before I end this dialogue, let me remind you of the next webinar, which will be conducted at the end of April, and it will be hosted by the Phoenix Center, and it will be focusing on informal work in light of the COVID-19. Thank you again for attending and I apologize for having to cut you short.